God is good, amen? Yes. Oh, man, before... Oh, a few minutes when we were just singing, I was sitting right over here, and I was just praying. You know, I was praying for you guys, praying for the speakers, praying for myself. Whoops. Um, but just to be here and hear you guys sing and pray with you guys, hear you guys just take over the worship, I don't know about you guys, but I think God has something really big to do this weekend. And so I just want to start off by just throwing it out there. Just say, buckle up, because I think God is coming here tonight. And so, hi. I just realized I don't know who you guys are. I'm Chris. Brian just said that, but I don't know who you are. And so if you can, please, just on the count of three, let me know what your name is. One, two, three. Beautiful names. But it's so good to be here tonight. I'm originally from Ohio, so to be back in the motherland just feels refreshing. But Ohio. But like Brian said, I live in Houston now. I'm basically in the desert. And I live there with my wife and kids. And since Bob and Brian showed you guys their kids, do you guys want to see some of mine? So here's, here's me and my wife, Grace. Isn't she pretty? She says hello, by the way. And then you see, you see my wife, Grace, holding our daughter, Magdalene. We call her Maggie. And I know she looks sweet right there, staring off into the distance, probably praying. Or at least that's what it looks like. But I'm telling you right now, that's the face of crazy. Maggie is two, and over the past few months, she started playing this game that I like to call, Will It Flush? <laughs> Some of you guys are ahead of me. Some of you guys know where I'm going with this. What she does is when me and my wife aren't looking, she will take off anywhere in the house, grab what she can reach, run to the bathroom, and flushes it down. Now the way that we play is that if she flushes it and it doesn't go down the pipe, I win. If it goes down, I lose. And I've learned a lot playing with uh, my daughter. Like an apple, can't flush it. You just can't. You cannot flush an apple. A whole roll of toilet paper, you can't flush it. That one surprised me. Little pieces, they're fine. Big ones, not so much. It doesn't go down. Butter knives. Butter knives flush. They, they also break your toilet. <laughs> I lost. <laughs> and then my other daughter, oh, she's not there anymore, but she was there. Our little, can we put her back up? I just kind of miss seeing her face. I'm holding Eden. She's uh, 11 months old, and she is the happiest, cutest little baby I've ever known, and she gets cuter every day. And... I mean it when I say that. I'm not trying to be like bragging that she's so cute and she's so awesome. But she's getting cuter every day. And if I wish I would have brought a picture so you guys could have seen what she looked like. Because a few months ago we took her to the doctor and they took her measurements just to make sure, you know, everything's healthy, just a checkup, no big deal. They took her height. I was like, this is gonna be fine, you know, like 25th percentile. She's kind of short. No big deal. I'm not the tallest guy. My wife is shorter than I am. We're going to have short little kids. No big deal. They took her weight next, 50th percentile. Not bad. I mean, she's shorter than most, but she weighs a little bit more than most. I like to eat. My wife is, my wife is Cajun. No big deal. Uh, she just likes to eat. But then they took her head size, the circumference of her head, 65th percentile. She was built like an upside down snowman. <laughs> but but she, she's growing into her head. And, and it, it looks good on her now. And she just took her first steps the other day, which, which is awesome. But I'm telling you, yeah, it's a proud moment. I'm telling you, though, if, if the walking thing doesn't work out for her, 
Thanks to her body type, she rolls like a champion. <laughs> but I, I hope she'll walk. But it's crazy being back here at Franciscan because this is kind of like where, where it all started for me and my family. I actually met my wife here at Franciscan. We were both students here. And I remember it like it was yesterday. And my wife and I were talking about it a few weeks ago, just trying to like relive that moment, even though part of me <laughs> doesn't exactly remember it the same way she does. See, we had a mutual friend who kind of hooked us up, who kind of set, set us up on this blind date. And I was excited. I kind of knew Grace, never had a conversation with her, but she seemed awesome. She was pretty, she seemed smart. She just seemed like she was the real deal. But I didn't know if she liked it, if she liked the idea of going out with me or going on a date with me. So I was real nervous, like real, like butterflies, not eat, just nervous. I remember waking up the day of our first date and just making a checklist of everything that I had to do. Shower, check. <laughs> Deodorant, check. Eat breakfast, check. Deodorant, check. You know, just <laughs> going through every little thing, making sure I didn't mess anything up because I wanted it to be perfect. And I remember going to pick her up and saying, hey, and you know, I didn't ruin it right away. Things seemed like they were going well. We were both poor college students at the time, and so we just went to the J.C. Williams Center back here, and we just got coffee. And there was this big, long line, and we're just chatting it up, and we're having fun. And we finally get to the front of the line. We order our food, and we order our drinks. And I reach for my wallet. Guess what wasn't on the checklist? I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any money. I had nothing on me. I, I mean, I, do I run? Do I, do, do I grab the coffee then run? Like what, what, do I, what do I do at that moment? And before I can even get a word out, Grace realizes what's happening and she slides some money across the counter and pays for our first date. I know. In my head, I'm thinking, I blew it, I'm done, I'm over, I'm going home. I go outside and I just chug my coffee with grace, thinking this is just going to be awful. But the rest of the date actually went really well, really, really well. We ended up just talking until like one in the morning. I remember going back to my friend who kind of set us up and I woke him up and I was like, dude, I'm going to marry this girl. Oh, oh, but before you all, oh, let's think about this for a second. She's beautiful, she's smart, and I get free coffee. <laughs> I mean, just logically, logically, it makes sense. And so I did, I married her. But I think back to that first date. I think back to that first encounter with my wife. And I just think about the pressure that I felt. You know, the internal questions that I asked myself, like, Am I good enough for her? Like, is she going to like me? Am I likable? Like, shoot, am I lovable? Like, how is this really going to go? And as I think about it, that's not the first time I ever felt that way. I mean, going back to grade school, do you guys remember recess or gym class being picked for different teams? Dodgeball? Football? Being on that fence is horrifying. I'll take Johnny, I'll take Nick, I'll take Chris, I'll take Chris, yes. Yeah, like it, feels, it feels good to be picked. You know, in high school, it was even worse. And maybe you guys can relate, but walking into a cafeteria and seeing the different cliques, the different groups of friends, and just thinking like, oh, I wish, I wish I could hang out with them, but I don't know if I'm cool enough. I, I, don't, I don't know if they like me, am I funny enough? Like, do I have the right clothes? Like, would they accept me? Or maybe it was a sports team that we try out for. Like, can I really make the cut? Prom? <laughs> Too soon. <laughs> Prom or homecoming? Just, is someone gonna like me? And college applications? You know, I just feel like we live in this world where we continually ask ourselves, like, am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? Am I likable? Am I lovable? Does anyone even notice me? 
And I think this mentality, these questions, these insecurities that I think we all have, I know I do, it can seep into our spiritual life. It can seep and approach us when we're approaching God. To where we come to something like this and we hear, God loves you, and our reaction is, really? I mean, yes, God loves the world. I, I, I believe that. You know, God loves us in this room? Sure. But God loves me? I mean, God loves me? Little old me, in my sin, in my mess, in my insecurities. God loves me? There are days I'm just not so sure. You know, I remember coming to conferences like this and retreats like this and seeing someone like Bob leading the band and being like, oh, God loves Bob. He has a voice like an angel. You know, and, and God loves Brian because Brian has a microphone and talks about God. But God loves me, like, not with my list, not with my sins. And I remember thinking, like, maybe I can do something. Maybe I can try to earn God's love. Maybe if I come to a retreat, maybe if I'm nice to everyone, maybe if I do the cross clap perfectly, God will love me. Because some days, I just don't know if he does. And if I'm really raw for a second, that's all I really want, is to be loved, is to be known, to be seen. And does God, with seven billion people on this planet, see little old me? If you've ever asked yourself these questions, if you've ever had this doubt, you're in the right place. Because this whole weekend is dedicated to this tension, to this question of are we chosen? And brothers and sisters, the answer is yes. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. We have a God who is madly and passionately in love with us. And there's nothing you can do about it. And this is the good news of the gospel, isn't it? I mean, this is what it's all about. We are loved. We are seen. We are cherished. We are chosen. Y'all, if you hear anything I say tonight, hear me right now. That we have a God who chose you before you were born. We have a God who chose to love you when others don't. We have a God who chooses to love you when you don't love yourself. We have a God who chooses you when we don't choose him. That's our God. And that's what this weekend's all about. Brian talked about that verse from 1 John. We love because God first loved us. It's one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. Because so many times I feel like we hear from other Catholic speakers or from our parents or from retreats that we need to go and do this, that we need to choose Jesus, and we need to go be the difference in the world. And yes, we need to do all of that. I'm not downplaying that. But we can't be who we're supposed to be until we know whose we are. And tonight, we're God's. And the beautiful thing about this is that this isn't just empty words. This isn't just nice little sentiments. But we can turn to Scripture and see that God backs this up. Time and time again, God calls the undeserving, the sinners, the marginalized, the outcast, because of love. You know, we could turn to the Old Testament and we could look at David, chosen to be the first king of Israel. Pretty good guy, but he was also an adulterer. Or we could look at Peter, our first pope, chosen to lead the entire church. He denied Christ when Christ needed him the most. Or we could even look at Paul, one of the greatest evangelists the church has ever known. 
he was a murderer. And when we hear God choose these people, is there really any doubt that God would not choose one of us? One of my favorite stories in Scripture is a story about Zacchaeus. He's this guy who lived in this town of Jericho. His name actually meant to be pure, to be whole, to be clean, to be just. But he was anything but that. In fact, he was the exact opposite. You see, he was a Jewish man, but he served the Roman Empire as a tax collector. And nobody likes paying taxes. I mean, can I get an amen for that? <laughs> but he didn't just collect taxes from people. No, he charged extra so he could line his own pockets. He was a thief. He was a cheat. He was a liar. He was an outcast. Nobody wanted to be with him. Nobody liked him. He had money, but that's it. He was alone. And one day, Jesus comes through this town of Jericho. And Jesus, at this time, he's a rock star. I mean, he is a rock star. Everyone wants to see Jesus. Everybody is out in the streets to just see if he's going to do some miracle, do some teaching, something, work some sign. And Zacchaeus is like, I want to see. I want to know what's going on. And so he runs out, and he wants to see Jesus, but he's too short, and the crowd's not letting him in. He can't see. He can't get close. And so he thinks, I got it. I'm going to run ahead. I'm going to climb this sycamore tree, and when Jesus walks by, I'll see him. Not a bad plan, Zacchaeus. I like it. But something crazy happens, something unexpected and I think we're actually going to put it up on the screen for you. And when Jesus came to the place where Zacchaeus is in the tree, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. I mean, picture this for a second. Like, picture this with me. Jesus is surrounded by people. He is walking through this town, and all of a sudden he stops. And he looks up. And he says, you. Zacchaeus, come down from there. Tonight, I'm coming to your place. I mean, who does that? Like, who, who really does that? Like, who really will stop, call someone by name when no one else is giving them the time of day? I'll tell you who. It's our God. And the thing I love about this story is that Jesus doesn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, Get your act together, and then come down. He doesn't say, hey, Zacchaeus, why don't you come down here and do something for me? Why don't you try and earn your keep with me? He doesn't say, Zacchaeus, come down and never, ever sin again. He says, no, come down. Take you just as you are. Y'all, I don't know where you guys are at right now. I don't know where you're coming from. Maybe some of you guys have been here three, four times, and you know, you know God loves you. You've been here, you've sang the songs, you've heard the talks. Well, tonight I want to tell you that God has more for you. He's calling you deeper. Maybe some of you guys came kicking and screaming your mom, your youth minister, your chaperone dragged you onto the bus, everything short of clubbing you to get you up there. I want you to know that God sees right where you are. And he's totally happy with where you're at. Because the fact that you're here is enough for him. But my gut tells me that the majority of the people here tonight are somewhere in between. Maybe we're kind of like Zacchaeus. Maybe we just plan to climb a tree. We just want to observe. We just want to come and see what the big deal is. But for you guys, Jesus is calling you into a relationship. 
Jesus is calling you into more. And it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been because God's love is bigger than we can ever imagine. All that he cares about is that we're here. You know, I've come to understand this truth more and more over the past few years as I've grown as a husband and as a father. And like I said before, I think God is gonna do something awesome this weekend and I cannot wait to see it unfold. But there's a part of me that is already kind of looking forward to being back with my family. I just miss them. It's kind of like I'm missing half of my lung. But I know when I walk through that front door, there's a good chance my wife is going to be pretty tired from watching the girls all weekend. And I I don't know, Maggie will probably come running up with something in her hand that she just broke, and Eden will come rolling up behind her. But at that moment, at that moment, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter if they're tired or if they're frustrated, if they're crying or screaming, if they're throwing a fit. It's not going to matter if they're mad or what they've done, if they have a dirty diaper, because they're mine. They're mine. And this weekend, God's calling us to the same truth, that we are his. I was talking to Tammy earlier. We were coming from the airport. And she was sharing that, you know, the greatest miracle of Jesus isn't necessarily the fact that he walked on water or that he healed people. But the miracle is that he sees and knows and loves each and every one of us. And this weekend, if you have any doubt of that, I just ask that you try. Try to wrap your mind around this truth. Because if we understand that we're chosen, if we come to know that we are God's, brothers and sisters, that's a game changer. See, when we are chosen, there's peace and there's love, and there's joy. And whether we know it or not, or feel it or not, we're seen, we're known, we're loved, and we're chosen. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 3, it talks about Jesus being at the door of our hearts. And just like with Zacchaeus, where he says, I'm coming into your house tonight. I'm coming into your place tonight. This weekend, God's extending that same invitation. That he's standing at the door of our hearts. And my prayer for you guys is that we can find the grace and the strength and the love to let him in.